your Bibles, just go ahead and turn them over to, uh, I was going to start in Revelation chapter 4, but I think I'll start in 1 Kings chapter 22. So we'll start off there, 1 Kings chapter 22. We're speaking on moving in spiritual dimensions and we've covered a lot of ground, a whole lot of things that we have covered. Hopefully to open up our understanding, open up our eyes to the world that we are living in and amongst. If we fail to understand the spiritual world, then we position ourselves to remain simply as victims of whatever the spiritual world wants to accomplish we've learned a few things over the over the months we learned that the natural realm is a child of the spiritual we learned that things take place twice once in the spiritual realm and once in the natural first in the spiritual then in the natural Every good thing and every evil thing is first established in the realm of the spirit. And then there is a work that is conducted to manifest it on the earth. Let me say that one more time because I believe this is very key. Every evil and every good thing is first established in the spiritual realm, in heavenly places. It is there. It takes place there. Then there is a work that is carried out in order to manifest it in the earth. So when something evil takes place in your life, it is because something in the spiritual realm broke through. When something good, a blessing, enters your life, it is because something from the spiritual realm broke through into your life. When things are being put together in the realm of the spirit and before it shows up on the earth, there is a gap in between that gives you and I the opportunity to alter it or change it before it arrives on the earth. Let me say that again. Every evil and good thing is established in spiritual realms, in heavenly places. But there is a gap between it and the manifestation of it in the earth that gives the Christian the opportunity to alter it. That's where your prayer life comes in. No matter what kind of evil is planned for your life, it first has to be settled in heavenly places before it can show up in your life. Giving you the opportunity to alter it. In that space in between the spiritual establishment of that activity and the manifestation of it on the earth in between God will look to speak to you visions dreams discernment God will inform you of what's going on in heavenly places that's what visions and dreams are for to let you know this is being organized in spiritual places it is looking to establish itself in your life. Now you have the opportunity to change it. Many times when people come to me and they say, Pastor, I just had a terrible dream, a nightmare. And I dreamed that this, this happened to, you know, to me, or to my spouse, or to my children, to my daughter. And it was very real. And it scared me. And I usually tell them, 
just because it happened up there, it doesn't mean it's going to happen down here. You're being informed about it so you can alter it. You're being informed. And it never shows up on the earth. It is heaven allowing you to see its first manifestation in the realm of the spirit. Through a vision, through a dream. It is heaven giving you insight and allowing you to, to become aware of what's being organized. Now giving you something to pray about. Something to pray about. See the life of Lot was all because Abraham was moving around in heavenly places and he had a visitation from the Lord and the Lord was letting them know what's about to happen to the city of Gomorrah and they knew that Abraham had a nephew in that city and that city was about to be judged and destroyed but not before talking to Abraham about it do we have any descendants of Abraham here? So before it happens, God will come and communicate with you. That's why prayer is so important. Because there you get informed. There you're given insight on what the spiritual realm is up to. Giving you the opportunity to pray, to prophesy, and alter it. Because in spiritual realms, destinies of individuals and destinies of nations are established before they manifest on the earth. Prayer is that important. So again, when evil finally shows up in your life, something broke through. When good comes into your life, something broke through. And now you're seeing the manifestation of it. It is the prayerless individual that chooses to live. It is the prayerless individual that chooses to live a life of chance. That whatever the spiritual realm dishes out, that is what the person will receive and have nothing to respond with. That person just takes, as they say, life as it is. So lives are cut short. Sometimes lives are a burden and fearful. Sometimes lives are blessed and can't be cursed. Because there are things from the realm of the spirit that are breaking through in the lives of people. Let's go ahead and look at 1 Kings. Today I'd like to speak to you on spiritual thrones established spiritual thrones established let me say this to you whenever change is sought after but you can't seem to grasp it it may be that it has been moved out of the reach of human effort whenever change is sought after but can't seem to grasp it it may be that it has been moved out of the reach of human effort in some extreme cases, a spiritual throne is established to do the work of advancing it into a bondage. A principality will sit on a throne to rule over it. So whenever you find yourself looking for change, but can't seem to establish it, and we know that change is necessary, we're trying to come out of something. Paul said it this way, the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. And the things that I do want to do, I end up not doing it. Oh, wretched man that I am. He knew that there was something else that was controlling his life. Because the things that he wanted to do, he couldn't get it done. And the things that he did not want to do, he ended up doing that. He knew something else was at work in his life 
I'd like to talk to us today about spiritual thrones that are established. Because whenever you find yourself as an individual or as a country with that kind of a struggle, it could be very well that a demonic throne has been established and it's ruling and reigning in the life of that person or even in the life of a nation. In 1 Kings, we see, uh, and I'm just going to summarize really quick because we've covered this before, but I think it'll set up what we're trying to learn today. A man by the name of Ahab, who was a king uh, of Israel, and King Ahab was a very, very evil man. He, he was king over God's people, and he led God's people into idol worship. He led God's people into rebelling against God. And many times he was warned by different prophets that were sent to him. And so King Ahab was, so to speak, provoking God. And what I'd like to do with this story is show you a spiritual throne because there are many spiritual thrones throughout creation. Many spiritual thrones. And each one differentiates on what it rules over or how it rules. Even you yourself are working off of a throne. And you can tell what kind of a throne you're working from by what you're able to command or not command. If a demon does not submit to you, it's because you're not, not operating from a throne that rules him. You're not operating from that kind of a throne. If you're not able to rebuke certain things is because you're not operating from a particular throne. And really the person who's, who's kept you out of that is self. You will deny yourself a throne by choosing something from the world. You will go after a lust of the world and deny yourself the opportunity to operate from certain thrones that command and rule over certain entities. Here we see a throne. Watch this carefully. that a man by the name of Micah, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, M-I-C-A-I-A-H, Micah. He is a man that is operating from a particular throne. And we see that he is present in a meeting with God where King Ahab's life is being discussed and Micah is informed and Micah is involved King Ahab had done so much evil that God was ready to allow judgment to come upon him and end his life in order to save a multitude in one life and save a multitude so let's look at it in verse 19, chapter 22, 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 19. Then Micah said, therefore hear the word of the Lord. So here Micah is now returning back to man's dwelling, the physical realm, with a word from the Lord. And this is what Micah says. He begins to describe where he's been at. And he says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left verse 20 and the Lord said who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead now if you can picture this God is on his throne 
and he has his governing body all around him he's got different spirits and angels and creatures around his throne and in that meeting is a man by the name of Micah because there's always got to be a representative from the earth when you enter into prayer you are approaching the throne of God as a representative of the earth so God asked uh, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Rith Gilead so one spoke in this manner and another spoke in that manner verse 21 then a spirit came forward then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said I will persuade him the Lord said to him in what way and the spirit said to the Lord I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets here King Ahab had assembled people that claimed to be prophets but really they were just telling him what he wanted to know they weren't hearing from God they weren't hearing from God they had personal agendas to get in good with the king so just tell them the Lord's going to bless you the Lord's going to do good watch this very carefully there are some churches that are not going to say anything negative to you even though you're on your way to becoming accursed because their personal agenda is to keep you in the church and tell you everything you want to hear they're not going to correct you they're not going to tell you that if you sin you're going to pay a very ugly price for that they're not going to tell you that you're wrong about anything every message will be an encouraging message and they're going to find scriptures in the Bible that are just inspirational they're not going to tell you that you're going to hell because of your behavior they're not going to do that because they are prophets with a lying spirit they're going to tell you what you want to hear they're not going to tell you what you need to hear so King Abe has surrounded himself with all these supposedly men of God and he was asking them look I'm going to go to war is the Lord telling you anything if I'm going to succeed and all of them said go and you shall succeed go and you shall succeed you're going to be awesome you're going to do great God is with you and yet his death in the spiritual realm was already organized he was supposed to go to war and fight at Ramoth Gilead and there he would be killed but all the men that got around him, around him were telling him he was good they didn't tell him anything about his idol worship they didn't tell him anything about his rebellious wife that he had Jezebel they didn't tell him anything about how he had introduced the people of God to idol worship they didn't tell him anything they tell him he was doing good and that he was going to succeed and God loves you and you know be encouraged and you hang in there you know God loves you just as you are uh, uh, you don't have to change you just be you yeah yeah you be you you'll be an accursed you you'll be a dead you so finally out of all the prophets they call for this guy named Micah and Micah is the only one that had been at the throne of God many spiritual leaders don't even have a prayer life how you can tell you know how you can tell there's no power you can't be in the presence of an almighty God and come out a natural person you can't if you're in the presence of something divine you're going to bring something from the earth you're going to manifest something supernatural all they have is an encouraging word 
a lying spirit. I'm not saying all of them, everybody who preaches a nice encouraging message is a lying spirit. But I'm telling you, there is a lot of it going on right now. A lying spirit. And you can tell because certain sin groups that advocate for a certain sin, they'll hang out at that church. Because they are very comfortable because nobody says anything to them. So they're very comfortable. So all the gossipers and liars, they all sit in one section. All the thieves and manipulators, they sit in a different section. All the adulterers and fornicators, another section. Homosexuality, in another section. And they are very comfortable there. Because the ongoing message is God loves you just the way you are. Don't bother changing. Micah here was in the realm of the spirit where the life of Abraham was being discussed. And it was declared that in order to save the multitude, his life would be done away with. And Micah was in that meeting. And Micah saw that when the Lord said, how are we going to get King Ahab to go to Ramoth Gilead? Because we've already planned that there he's going to die. There he's going to die. A spirit comes forward. He says, I'll get him there. And the Lord asks, how are you going to do it? He says, I'm going to be a lying spirit in all his prophets. And through his prophets, we're going to tell him, you're going to do good. Go ahead and go to war. Go to Ramath Gilead and you shall succeed. And when he goes there, a different spirit is going to meet him there. And there he'll, his life will end. couple things we can learn from here is that one not everybody who calls himself a man or a woman of God is such we're living in some very dangerous times very dangerous times and that's why I have some of the the policies and, and, and things that I promote one be careful who lays hands on you two be careful who speaks into your life now I'm just being a good parent that's all I'm doing just like you tell your children hey be careful who you hang around with hey you be, be careful who puts their hands on you you tell that to your children all the time well, as a spiritual father, as a pastor, I do the same thing. Be careful who lays hands on you. Why? Because they're imparting into you what they have. When they speak a word into your heart, if you stay under the hearing of that voice long enough, they'll impart. The... Jesus would breathe the spirit. The human soul is able to breathe the spirit. So you have to be careful who breathes into your life. Because this is a spiritual world. And so here Micah is working off of this throne. He's working from a throne that outranks the king, King Ahab. King Ahab is working off of one throne. He's the king of Israel. But Micah is working off of a different throne that now is commanding the throne that King Ahab sits on. And we're talking about one throne against another one. Amen. One is a natural throne in one sense, but has a demonic spirit or principality sitting on it that it's expressing itself through King Ahab. Then you have another throne where Micah sits, where the spirit of God is expressing himself through Micah. And they're both going at it. Because only thrones command only thrones rule here we go let's let's move on jump over over with me if you will over to revelation chapter 4 revelation chapter 4 and let's look at what's going on here Re Revelation chapter 4 and at some of these things we've covered it some of these things I've said hey I'm going to touch on it a little bit and then I'll preach a bit you know preach on it more three weeks from now well those three weeks are here 
<laughs> We're there now, okay? So some of these things, I've alluded to it uh, just in passing by in another message. Uh, but here I'm really trying to drive the point home. In Revelation chapter 4, we get a sneak peek into the throne room of God. What I'm trying to establish in your mind here is to see the spiritual staff of God and how you are part of that staff. There's always a human being there when issues are being discussed concerning activity on the earth. So let's look at it. Verse Chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, John, here's the apostle John saying this. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So here John is granted access to the throne room of God. The apostle John is given access into the throne room of God. You have to be given access in order for you to attend some of these secret meetings that take place around the throne of God. Verse 2, he says, Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Do you see that? Trying to give you a picture of what is going on around the throne room of God. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting. So here we're seeing one throne, the throne of God. And then we're seeing 24 additional thrones where 24 elders are sitting there. Now there's a lot of speculation on who, who these elders are. Some people believe that these are elder angels that are sitting around the throne of God. Some believe that these 24 thrones are occupied by uh, 12 representatives from the 12 tribes of Israel from the Old Testament and 12 apostles from the New Testament making 24. Some believe it is that. I lean toward more where these are not angels, but they are people that are representing certain things on the earth. Why? Because we see them wearing white robes and crowns. And angels are not given crowns. Now they can steal the crown. Who did that? Satan himself became a prince. But these are wearing white robes and they wear crowns. So understand, watch this. Understand that you are destined to be sitting on thrones. As prince under the lordship of God the king. And here we see 24 that are sitting. Let's move on. Did you know that a day is coming where you will sit and judge angels, the Bible says. You will sit and judge angels because you are destined to sit on a throne. Okay? Here we go. So we see 24 elders that are seen there. It says, uh, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thundering, and voices. What a meeting that must have been. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, this is a place that you, you and I need to be comfortable and familiar with because we have to be dwelling in heavenly places, including this one. If we are to function on the earth at the capacity that God wants us to function at. Verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures. Now if you remember a couple services ago. We talked about four living creatures in the book of Ezekiel. Anybody remember that? Four living creatures in the book of Ezekiel. These creatures had four faces. They had four wings. And then the book of Ezekiel spoke about a different spirit, what I call a wheeled spirit, 
Ezekiel had this vision and he saw these, these living creatures and he saw these wheels. Uh, the Bible describes a wheel within a wheel that had a spirit attached to it. And the Bible says that Ezekiel was moved into the spiritual realm and where Ezekiel uh, went, these spirits went with him. Even the wheels went with him. Why? Because you are called to govern and to rule alongside God. And spirits and angels are there to serve you and help you carry out your duties. And Ezekiel was moving about in spiritual realms and these spirits were going with him. These angels were going with him. These four living creatures were moving with him. Trying to get us to see ourselves in a different light. You're just not Pedro who works at the local tire shop. Or you're not Maria that works at Walmart. You're just not that. You are a child of God that is operating from a spiritual throne. And that's why spirits will bow down depending on the throne that you are operating from. And other spirits will not bow down. But in, in, in essence, they may just attack you. Remember the sons of Sceva? They said they were trying to cast out these demons. And the demons respond and says, hey, we know Paul. We know Jesus. We've never heard of you. What, what, what throne are you from? Well, yo soy de la bonita part. No, <laughs> Anyway. and those spirits came out and beat them because they weren't functioning from the correct throne that would force these demons to submit to him and that's why you'll get into prayer and you'll command certain things and nothing will happen because you're not there nothing will happen you're not moving in spiritual dimensions you're just moving in the physical dimension you have the authority of man and that's it and though you might be the I don't know school superintendent or the chief of police on the earth in the realm of the spirit mm -mm. You, don't, you don't you carry no rank if you don't move in spiritual dimensions and begin to operate from thrones are you hearing me this morning all right so we see here that there's a staff around the throne of God we see four living creatures we see angels we see John that is there we see Ezekiel that is there God is a king and so he operates as one and he has a territory known as his kingdom God does not govern his creation all by himself instead he establishes a governing body and so we see this in Revelation chapter 4. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created man that would be perfect for that realm. And he placed them there so he could govern. He would, on his behalf, so that he could rule on God's behalf. God is always expanding his governing body. God is always expanding his governing body. See, before, before you were a Christian, maybe devils kicked your life around. Maybe tormenting spirits came into your life and they did whatever. And then you became a Christian. And then you began to learn. And then you begin to become spiritually wise. And then you receive insight. And then you got into prayer. And then you attended the old way. You began to learn about prophesying. And you began to learn about moving in spiritual dimensions. Now you became a governing body of the government of God. And those spirits that used to harass you, now you're harassing them. When you wouldn't walk into a dark building, now when you do, darkness leaves. You don't leave, darkness leaves. Amen. Because you're operating from a, from a different throne now. Huh? 
When you used to be scared of their noises, now you're making your own noise. <laughs> Amen? Why? Because the governing body of God has expanded. You are now part of it. Now the scripture says, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You shall cast out devils in my name, so forth and so on. What is he saying? The governing body of God has grown. Jesus grew it by 12. He went around and he found 12 individuals. A fisherman, a doctor, a text collector, so forth and so on. He recruited, and he, he, he raised them from ordinary people into believers, into disciples, into apostles. And now they were going around turning cities upside down, casting out devils, raising the dead. The shadow of Peter was causing people to become healed. Paul was moving in spiritual dimensions. Incredible. Philip was moving in spiritual dimensions. He'd be here one moment, the next moment he'd be over there. What happened? These were ordinary people. They became disciples. They became apostles. You know that that is the three-step program that we have at the OA. One, to win the lost through evangelism. Number two, to bring them into general discipleship on Sundays. And number three, give them advanced discipleship to produce spiritual leaders. Win the lost, make disciples of all nations, and send out leaders. That is the whole agenda of the old way. The whole agenda, three steps. Win the lost, make them disciples, and then make them leaders. Who are leaders? Leaders that are leading others to the throne of God. There's our whole agenda with your life. This is what we're up to with you. If you ever thought, man, what are these guys up to with my life? That's what it did. We're looking to make you a disciple and then raise you as a leader and then send you out there to go find more, win the loss, help us make disciples of them and turn them into leaders over and over and over again. It's the same process that Jesus, that Jesus implemented. He went and found 12, made them disciples, advance them into apostles and send them out to the world and they shook the world for God the king amen? amen the history of mankind is filled with clashes of governments it is usually what dominates world news yet the bible shows us that behind the scenes of wars between nations they are the result of spiritual governments fighting for dominance it is actually spiritual governments fighting for dominance. That's what was going on in World War I, World War II, and in the future wars. It's spiritual governments looking to take dominance over territories. It's what's going on in the Middle East with the land of Israel. It's spiritual governments looking for dominance of territories. And so we, we see this from the very beginning because when God created the earth, it became the focal point of the spiritual world and the spoils of war. When God created the earth, it became the focal point of the spiritual world. God had created the spiritual world before he created the earth and before he created Adam. Angels were already existing. These uh, four living creatures were already existing. These spirits were already existing. A spiritual world already existed. Then God expanded it and added a physical dimension. And then he created man and put him there to govern that one. And when he did that, the entire spiritual world focused now on the earth. Why? Because they were astounded that now in that dimension was a creature that it was in a likeness, an image of God. And he would be operating like God. And they were all interested in taking over his position. Spirits were interested in your position and mine. So, they put out a plan. They sent their best guy, Satan, disguised as a serpent, put him in the garden. It began to work to turn man into rebellion against the government of God. And cease that throne and establish itself as the new prince. That's what Satan did. Satan seized the opportunity to sit on the throne that Adam sat on. How do I know this? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2. 
Look at what how the scripture refers to uh, uh, verse, uh, refers to Satan as. In Ephesians chapter 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the prince, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now work, works in the sons of disobedience. Disobedient to what? Disobedient to God. There is a spirit that is working in every individual that knows between right and wrong and still chooses to, to, to disobey. There is a spirit at work there. It's the spirit that is being moved by the prince of the power of the air, Satan himself. It provokes and stirs up a rebellion against God. That's what they did with Adam and Eve. Stir up a rebellion against God. Stir it up in their hearts. Make them believe that God is trying to deny them something. And cause an uprise against the government of God. So Satan manipulates Adam and Eve into questioning the motives of, of their government, God. And as a result... Satan succeeds at establishing a rebellion against God's government. You see that in Genesis chapter 3. You'll begin to notice as you read your Bible that when it comes to human governments, God knows or makes us aware that it is the spirit behind even human governments. So when Joseph had led his people into Egypt they had favor with a particular Pharaoh Pharaoh had bowed down to Joseph because Pharaoh had seen the power of God through Joseph and so Pharaoh knew that he was confronted by a higher throne and so Pharaoh bows the knee to Joseph so what does Satan do he sends another representative that operates from a different throne. And when those spirits came into Egypt, they enslaved Joseph's people. They had brought in a different representative from a different throne. It wasn't just the exchanging of pharaohs. It was the exchanging of thrones. So when the new pharaoh came in, it was a new principality that came in. And he saw the nation of Israel prospering and being fruitful and multiplying. And he says, no, 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 no. We're going to put a stop to this. I don't know why this other guy, this other Pharaoh put up with this. No, put them all in slavery. A different spirit from a different throne walks into Egypt and makes God's people bow the knee. So what happens? God responds to that and watch what he does he calls Moses up and he tells Moses stick your hand in your cloak pull it out leprosy you see that Moses throw your stick on the ground pick it up turns into a snake God was saying we're going to confront not Pharaoh but the gods of Egypt we're going to go confront that throne that just established itself in Egypt so God raises up a higher ranking spiritual entity named Moses and trains him in the supernatural and then sends him to Egypt and Moses is moving the weather and the animal world with his hands like a conductor moves an orchestra and Moses moves his hands and here comes hail and fire Moses raises his stick and the water supplies turns into blood what happened a different government individual from the government of God stepped into Egypt and dethroned that Pharaoh that spirit that was there he confronted the gods of Egypt and submitted them he took the people out and then destroyed that entire nation are you hearing this spiritual governments clashing each one picking a representative 
to go and confront a particular throne that is ruling and reigning either illegally or ruling and reigning on behalf of God. Oh, let me, oh, I am so far behind. Here we go. So besides the throne of God, there are lesser thrones established over certain parts of his creation, kind of in the likeness of governors over states. Let's look at Colossians 1.16. Very interesting here. Colossians 1.16. It says, for by him, talking about Jesus Christ, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth now here's where people get confused i was listening to this man's uh testimony and what he was testifying he he uh, you know he's a christian i was watching him and but he still was a little confused and he was saying i had a hard time becoming a christian because i've seen so much bad in the world and i couldn't understand why god would allow that and that confuses a lot of people. The one statement that confuses a lot of people is this statement right here. God is in control. You'll hear it from preachers and you'll hear it in Christian music. And that confuses the Christian. Because if God is in control, what happened here? Did God fall asleep at the wheel? My life is a mess. And so if God is so good, why did he allow this thing to come into my life? That is wrong. God is not in control. His laws are. And when you align yourself with his laws, good comes into your life. If you're unalign yourself with his laws, bad come into your life. Why? Because God gave you the power of choice. You choose. Moses said, you choose blessing or cursing. You choose. It's not God doing it. If there's evil in the world, it's because man rebelled against God. If there's evil in your life, it's because a spiritual entity broke through the spiritual realms and found access into your life. That's what the Bible says, give no place to the devil. That means it is possible to give him place. So when evil comes into your life, it gained access. Somewhere it gained access. But people blame God. Look at the mess in my life. If God is so good, why is this going on? It's because of your choices. That you did not take the spiritual realm into account that gave Satan access. In every choice that we make, in everything that we do and everything we say, we better take the spiritual realm into account. We better take spiritual thrones into account because they will flood our lives and they will come in and they'll conduct the work of bringing us into bondage and they'll establish a throne over our family line and a principality will be stationed at that throne to rule and reign over our lives. All the while saying, where is God? God is on his throne. Let's move on. Look at, okay, uh, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth and that are visible and invisible. Watch this. Watch what, watch what this scripture is listing. Because we're talking about thrones. We're talking about principalities and rulers of the darkness. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities, rulers of the darkness, spiritual hosts in wicked places. But look at the list here that's, that, that is letting us know that this is what God created by Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ he says by by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and visible things whether thrones dominions or principalities or powers all things were created through him and for him now watch the list that he's making right there now let's go take a look uh, or, or take a look at the list from Ephesians chapter 6 if you will Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Now remember this list. Now look, let's go over to 6.12. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? There's that, there's that, that throne again. 
but against principalities. Here's another one. Against powers, against rules of the darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Do you notice the similarity here? That God established spiritual thrones around his creation. And this was going to be what Adam would be overseeing would appoint individuals to sit on these thrones and help govern the earth this was supposed to have been Adam's governing body but when Adam fell these spiritual thrones principalities and powers and rulers rulers all these all these uh, spiritual thrones when Adam fell those thrones were vacated and Satan took them over and he put principalities on these thrones. Oh, so now you have principalities, rulers of the darkness, sitting on thrones that maybe those 24 elders were supposed to have been sitting at. This was supposed to have been Adam's governing body. But when he fell, those thrones were vacated and Satan was elevated to the prince of the power of the air and he set up principalities. Prince, principality means a prince over a region. A prince over a region. That's what a principality is. A particular authority figure that like a governor, he's given the task of overseeing a particular region that's what a principality is so Satan occupies those thrones and now you have thrones around the globe that were supposed to have been occupied by God's people now are occupied by demonic spirits because Adam was going to rule from the air but instead, Satan became the prince of the power of the air. So this is how you can tell when there is a throne established, how we started. When you're trying to bring change to something and you can't. You're trying to bring change to your life, to your community, to your nation, and you can't. Because in order to do that, you have to dethrone that principality that is ruling and reigning over that territory. And no matter how hard you try to change things, you can't. Because unless you bind the strong man, you cannot take his spoils. And you can't take that family of yours that has a demonic throne established over it for generations. You cannot take your family. You cannot take it back until you dethrone that spirit. And to dethrone that spirit, you're going to have to be a spirit that moves in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why Ephesians 1.8? For he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Where? In heavenly places. And he made you alive raised you up and made you to sit where in heavenly places in Christ Jesus in other words if you can't operate up there you won't be able to dethrone a principality that is ruling and reigning over your life or over your family that's why your family will always be known for divorce or your family will always be known for substance abuse or your family will always be known for sexual perversions and even though you become a Christian you still cannot dethrone them. Why? Because you're just a Christian that shows up every once in a while to church. You're not advancing into different thrones. You're not advancing in spiritual dimensions. You're not advancing in your spiritual ranking. You're of the lowest rank. And when you try to confront a demon, it doesn't have to bow down to you. You know how your, your spiritual ranking increases? By the degree of light that you carry from God. By the degree of light that you carry. There are certain demons that can't handle your light. Ah. Oh. So in Colossians chapter 1, we read where all these thrones are established. 
And they were supposed to have been running God's creation. But in chapter 6, now it's telling us that we're having to wrestle against them. The, th the thrones that God created through Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ, those, those thrones, now we're having to wrestle against them. Why? Because when something in the realm of the Spirit makes its way to the natural arena, it'll be very hard to change. Where you were supposed to have changed it is in between. Oh, are you getting this? You were supposed to change it up there. Why? That is where you're seated and that is where you're blessed. Once it's down here, now you're going to have to cast out devils. Now you're going to have to pray and fast. Now you're going to have to wrestle. But none of that would have been necessary if you would have caught on to what God was trying to tell you in the realm of the spirit and altered it up there. And the only thing that manifested was God's blessing in your life. But because you're spiritually deaf, you're not hearing them. And because you're not spiritually minded, you're not seeing things. And because you're spiritually numb, you're not discerning nothing. Because you might be more in tune to the things of the world than to the realm of the spirit. And when God was saying to you, don't go there or don't do this or make this, you never picked it up. So when we move by our natural desires, Whatever is in the natural spirit uses it as an entryway. Whenever you move by your lustful desires, a spirit found an open door. I'm out of time, but run over to Ezekiel, please, real quick. Ah, watch. Ezekiel, oh, let me see, let me see. Let me, let me see how I, I can condense this. Uh, let me see. I'm, I'm going to jump a lot of things, so give me a minute here. Ezekiel chapter... Let me summarize 26 and 27. And then I'm going to go into 28. Can we do that? Okay. In chapter 26, well, let, let me back up a little bit. Uh, the, the, the book of Ezekiel is about a man of God that God raises up because Israel, again, is in deep rebellion. Deep rebellion. It had become so bold in its idol worshiping that God is ready to judge it. But watch. Before, this, before that judgment, enters into the natural arena God has to go find a man a representative from the earth who does he find he finds Ezekiel he finds Ezekiel that's what the whole book of Ezekiel is about God is going to judge the nation of Israel Judah is going to judge it but before he can do that he has to find a representative to make his way to the throne room of God and listen in on the judgments that are about to be released on the earth on Israel so Ezekiel is in the meetings at the throne of God and he's being told this is what's going to happen but before we do that this is what we're going to do Ezekiel we're going to send you to the nation of Israel and I'm going to show you what they're doing behind closed doors now, the book of Ezekiel is incredible because it really reveals man moving through spiritual realms so it and I've shared this before with you but on some occasions you'll see where Ezekiel is taken the Bible says from a lock of his hair and he is suspended between heaven and earth we're, 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 gonna, we're gonna be teaching more about moving in spiritual dimensions we poked at it for a little bit but Ezekiel is taken into the realm of the spirit and is taken to Jerusalem and he is taken to the temple and God says look behind the door look at what these guys are doing and he sees a room full of idols he says you see that that's why I'm gonna judge them and he takes him to a different part of the city to a different part of the temple he says now 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 look at the elders of Israel look at what they're doing you see what they're doing the bloodshed they're causing this is why I'm gonna judge them so Ezekiel is taken on a tour of Jerusalem and the temple 
Now Ezekiel himself is a captive because the land of Israel had already been invaded once, twice, and it would be invaded a third time. And Ezekiel is living a godly life in the middle of all of that. But Ezekiel is moving in spiritual realms and God is showing him things that only God knows. When you move in spiritual realms, you'll know things that only God knows. That's why, you, that's why you look at an individual and you say, you know what? I know you already. I already know. I don't know how, but I already know you. And you begin to learn things about that individual. Why? Because in the realm of the spirit, his whole life is exposed up there. That's where prophets hang out at. Uh, and you walk in and you know, I, I know you already. Where do I see that in the Bible? We already taught on that. Remember? Paul and who? Ananias. Paul and Ananias met in, met in the realm of the spirit first. And then for the second time they met on the earth. Ananias laid hands on Paul in the realm of the spirit. So Paul could receive his sight in the realm of the spirit. Then Ananias is told, go to a street. And you'll find a man named Saul. That is at this particular house. And he has already seen you lay hands on him so he can regain his sight. So Ananias goes and does for the second time what he already done in the realm of the Spirit. In the realm of the Spirit, he had already met Paul. On the earth, he would meet him for the second time. And you miss church for the mall. Crazy. The things that we give up. Not understanding what God is looking to give us. It is incredible. Can I finish this real quick? Okay. And so Ezekiel is caught up in this. And so Ezekiel is now has to go talk to a city by the name of Tyra. T-Y-R-E. Correct? Tyra. <sighs> this book is a divine work. Watch this. The, uh, 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 Tyra is broken up into um, an old city and a new one. The new one is stationed on an island about half a mile from the mainland. And on the shore is old Tyra, the old city of Tyra. Now, if you don't come to church, go check out history and find an individual that built a causeway from that shore all the way to that island in order to, to, to capture it and destroy it. You don't even have to read the Bible. The Bible will tell you that. And a causeway was built by a, an incredible army general with a massive army. And nobody could take that island because it was an island. The waters were used as its fortress. And, and King Nebuchadnezzar tried to take it over, but he couldn't. So this incredible warrior destroys the old city takes all its rubble and begins to build a causeway all the way to the island does anybody study history here anybody know who i'm talking about well i'm not gonna tell you then huh He was a young warrior. Let me give you another hint. Huh? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. You don't even have to read your Bible. Just go read your history books. But you know what? The Bible talked about it before Alexander was even born. The Bible says that rubble was taken in order to take over the island he says and the day will come that on those stones fishermen would lay their nets to dry you know to this day fishermen lay their nets on these stones to let their dry their nets dry and God spoke about it 
way before history came across it. Alexander the Great. So, God is telling Ezekiel to tell Tyra that an army is coming and it's going to destroy. God is talking about Alexander the Great. He says, there's going to come an army and they're going to besiege you. And just go read history and, you, and you'll read the whole account right there. So, Ezekiel is telling the seed of Tyra, look, this is coming at you. This is coming at you. That's coming at you. Then God sends Ezekiel go, to go talk to the prince of Tyra, to the ruler of Tyra. Go talk to him and tell him what's coming too. Because he's the one that caused all of this. So in chapter 28 is where we pick it up. Where Ezekiel is sent to speak to the prince of Tyra. Now if you're not spiritually minded. This will throw you off. And this is why the scripture does not make sense to the carnal minded Christian. Does not make sense. And in I think it must have freaked out the prince of Tyra too. And maybe even Ezekiel. Because now the throne of God was moving. And let me see if you recognize this conversation. So if you can picture in your mind, Ezekiel's operating from a certain throne. And he approaches another throne, the prince of Tyra, who had done evil against the nation of Israel. And Ezekiel is there to prophesy over him and tell him about his judgment. Watch this. It's one throne confronts another throne to explain to him the judgment that is coming. Let's go look at it. Verse 20, chapter 20, verse 1. Watch this carefully. Now some of you guys that uh, are pretty... Uh, well versed in the Bible let me see if you pick this up see what's going on here chapter 28 verse 1 then the word of the Lord came to me this is Ezekiel speaking the word of the Lord came to me again saying son of man say to the prince of Tyra thus says the Lord now again pictures in your mind Ezekiel is speaking to a man the prince of Tyra the ruler of that city and he's looking at him and he's prophesying something to him. Watch what he says. Because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God. Behold, I'm in verse 3. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of nations. And they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you, will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God? But you shall be a man and not a God. In the hand of him who slays you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised. By the hand of aliens or strangers, for I have spoken, says the Lord. Verse 11. Moreover, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyra and say to him, thus says the Lord. Now watch. Let's go back. 
before he was talking to the prince of Tyra. Now he's speaking to the king of Tyra. Now he's speaking to a different throne. Don't let me lose you now. He's speaking to a different throne. And watch what he says to that different throne. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyra and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. What's going on there? Who is he talking to? Because the person he's talking to, he says, you were in the garden of God back over there in Genesis. Watch. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you in the day you were created. He says, within your design, you had timbrels and pipes. Within your design. Who is he talking to? He started talking to one throne, the prince of Tyra. Now he's speaking through that throne to a higher throne. Now he's speaking to the king of Tyra. Who is he speaking to? Don't say that yet. Verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. The king of Tyra was on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. <laughs> Who is he talking to? He starts off by talking. Let's just say Ramiro here is the prince of Tyra. He starts off by speaking to the prince of Tyra. That's one throne. Now Ezekiel goes higher, and he speaks through him. To the higher throne that is governing and ruling him and he speaks to the king of tyra who is that satan himself the anointing cherub so ezekiel goes past the human throne the natural throne and he deals with the principality that is sitting on that throne the demonic spirit is sitting on that throne okay but there's a kingdom going another against another kingdom so he deals with the principality. Then he has to go to the prince of the power of the air, Satan himself. And he tells them, you were the anointed cherub. You had pipes and, and, and uh, what do we call it? Uh, timbrels built in your system. You were in the mountain of God, Satan. You were the anointed cherub until iniquity was found in you and I cast you out. And if you keep on reading, you'll see where God says, this is how your judgment is coming to. Let's all stand. I'm out of time. If the church does not learn, first of all, if the church does not become spiritually minded, it will never learn the spiritual realm. If it doesn't know the spiritual realm, the church will never move in spiritual dimensions. If it doesn't move in spiritual dimensions, then the church or the Christian will always be a victim of what happens up there because he can't rule and reign up there because he's busy sitting in the natural arena so if the Christian does not learn how to be spiritually minded 1 Corinthians chapter 2 cannot discern the things of the spirit 1 Corinthians chapter 2 again 
then it won't be able to wrestle against principalities and powers. That means that he remains a slave. That means that a demonic spirit can come into your life or your family life and establish a throne on a post. On a post. Now watch this. If the American church doesn't become a spiritual organization, because for a much part it's not. If it doesn't become a spiritual organization, principalities are already established. Thrones, demonic thrones are already established in America. And the natural church can't do a thing about it. Look at this transgenderism stuff and this homosexuality stuff. There's already a throne established in America. That's why you're seeing it take over. It took over the White House already. That's why they put those rainbow colors. It's already taken over the political arena. This perverse spirit of sexual immorality already took over the American government. It already took over the American education system. It already took over the entertainment industry. Why? Why is it doing it? Unopposed? Because the church is not spiritual enough to do anything about it. Because to do something about it, you're going to have to unseat that demonic principality. You're going to have to unseat it. Whenever you see a particular sin, and I'm not talking about the people because the people are beautiful. I'm talking about the demonic spirit behind it. Whenever you see something taken over, it's evidence that a throne has been established and a principality has been stationed there. And that's why you see certain sins that are spreading across the nation and across the world. Certain sins that are spreading. Why? Because there is a throne, a demonic throne established and there's a principality sitting over it watching over that work ruling and reigning and the Christian can do nothing about it that's why Satan can, can kill our sons and daughters and the church can do nothing about it the suicide rate is out of control among youth out of control and the church can do nothing about it you know why you know why suicide is taken over because there's a throne that's been established and the church is the, the church does not operate from a throne the church is only operating from the earth now you see why I say stuff that goes on in Christianity that is so dumb come to our church and we give you a free TV how in the hell are we gonna stop the spirit of suicide among youth by giving away a freaking TV and how was the church going to wake up if all you tell it is what it wants to hear? I didn't finish this, sec I, I didn't finish this message. Next Sunday, I'm going to take you into Revelation chapter 6, and you're going to read about the seals. And then I'm going to take you into chapter 8, and you're going to read about the bowls. And then I'm going to take you further down, and you're going to read, um, I mean, you're gonna read about the trumpets, and then you're going to read about the bowls. Why? Because the church, number one, has to preach the saving grace of God. And number two, it has to prepare the world for the judgments that are coming. That's what Moses did. Moses saved his people and prepared Egypt for the destruction that was coming. Ezekiel prepared the world for the destruction that is coming. The church has to preach the saving grace of God, but it also has to let the world know you're in for a judgment. But in the meantime, there are principalities that are going to make your life a nightmare and there's nothing you can do about it and yet you attend church on Sundays why because you're not advancing to a different throne you're not advancing in spiritual ranking because you're not advancing in spiritual ranking that principality that's ruling and reigning in your family doesn't have to go anywhere We have just as much divorce in the church as we do in the world. 
What was it? Uh, Adrian. Adrian was telling me a story that when they were giving birth to their baby, him and Alian, the doctor freaked out that they were married. He says, because most of the time when we're delivering babies is to unmarried people. He said it was a shock that a married couple was having a baby because it's unheard of in our culture anymore. The principality already destroyed the concept of marriage between a male and a female. Now there's a principality that is ruling and reigning this confusing society of what is a man and what is a woman. Then there's a principality that's established to bring suicide to youth. Now that principality is now operating in the school system. And there's a church in every corner of the city. And yet we are engulfed in darkness. And there's nothing we can do about it. Because to rule and reign, you have to do it from the spiritual realm. You have to be operating from a throne. If you cannot move in spiritual dimensions, a principality may decide to establish a throne over your household, over your life. And that's why your family will be known for certain things. Indicative of the kind of spirit that rules and reigns there. Perversion in this family. Violence in this family. Substance abuse in this family. And I'm not talking bad about any human being. I'm talking about the spirits that are driving this agenda. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness. The church must put away these tactics that keep it as a natural organization and advance the people into spiritual dimensions they begin to unseat principalities and they begin to rule and reign in our society again when the principalities take over a society completely like it did with Saddam and Gomorrah, then God has no choice but to destroy it. When evil and principalities had taken over the entire earth, God sent Noah to prepare the world for judgment. Get the world ready. Why? Because these demonic principalities are sitting on thrones and there's no one to confront them. So why does God have to destroy a society? Because the human body is the link between the natural realm and the spiritual realm. No spirit can establish itself on the earth without human cooperation. Without human cooperation. The body is the badge that authorizes a spirit to function on the earth. That's why demons are looking to possess you and the Holy Spirit is looking to come on the inside of you. Because there is a law, Genesis 1, 26, 28. No spirit can establish anything on the earth without the use of a human body. Not even God himself. That's why he had to go find Moses. That's why he had to be born as a man, Jesus Christ. Because no spirit can operate on the earth without a human body. So principalities found access through a human body and established thrones on the earth. On the earth. That's why the Holy Spirit is looking to empower you. The Bible says He'll come upon you and in you. Why? Because He Himself needs a body. But Christians have to advance into operating from these thrones that God established that have been occupied by demonic principalities. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, my Lord. Without us as your people growing up, my Lord, in spiritual understanding, we will remain helpless victims, my Lord. 
uh, whatever Satan and his principalities are out to do. Father, as the world turns its back on you more and more and more, Father, raise up us, my Lord, your church, your people, my Lord. Raise us up in spiritual understanding and equip us like you've always wanted to do so that with our prayers and prophesying, we can dismantle these thrones, unseat those demonic principalities, and set captives free. Only then, my Lord, could a revival come to America and around the world. If God's people, who are called by your name, will turn from their wicked ways and humble themselves, then you will hear from heaven and heal our land. It is up to your people, my Lord, to become spiritually minded and come to understanding of all that you accomplished through the cross of Christ. How you made us alive and raised us up to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Help us to come to that understanding, my Lord. Help us to cultivate that kind of a spiritual walk we can walk with you my Lord be at your throne and listen in on how destinies are being determined for situations on the earth help us to move into these spiritual realms my Lord where we can receive divine revelation my Lord where we can receive empowerments from you my Lord that we can walk on this earth as children of light being fruitful multiplying subduing and having dominion you have called us to that kind of walk help us father help us get there in jesus name i pray and we all say amen pastor mark come take it